Welcome to Authors Revealed. I'm Becky Anderson. I'm excited. We have New York Times bestselling author Jane Green here with her new novel. It's called Tempting Fate. Kirkus Reviews calls it a scarlet letter for the 21st century. Well, Jane, welcome to Naperville and to Anderson's. Thank you. We were thrilled when they called, St. Oh. Martin's called and said that you were coming because we have so many readers that absolutely adore your books. Oh. And this one being number 15, wow. Yeah. Is it still a thrill for you when that book is finally out in the world, that, you know, that baby is now out in the world and on bookstore shelves? Is it still, even with number 15? Um, it, it is still a yeah. thrill. The bigger thrill for me and the one that, that has never changed or lessened is when I happen to stumble upon people reading my books, oh, like on, bet, a, yeah. on a train or a plane, or, and then I just, <gasps> oh, yeah. that, that's the most exciting thing still after all these yeah. years. So, so is it, you kind of go up to, how, how are you enjoying that book? I do, <laughs> you do I do, I, I can't help it, and I know I shouldn't, but I do, I, I, that's exactly what yeah. I do. I sidle over and I, get, and I ask them, you know, are you enjoying it? And then I sort of reluctantly confess to being yeah, the right. author. And usually they're completely shocked and they don't know what to say, and it, the whole thing becomes really awkward and you have to just sort of <laughs> go imagine. off and leave them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. So this book has been out in, in the United States for about a little over two weeks. Yeah. And you, I know you have a very devoted, you know, readership that, that follows you with yeah. every book. What are you hearing so far about Tempting Fate from, um, from your Mostly fans? I'm hearing confessions. Um, ah. uh, yeah, it's been, it's been really interesting. I, I love this book and this book... Um, you know, it, it was really drawn from seeing this thing happen with right. women my age, women who who had been happily married until they weren't. Right. Um, and and it, it clearly has struck a chord because people are coming up to me and I'm getting emails, I'm, I'm getting messages on Facebook. And sure. when women are whispering, this is... This is uh, you coined it. This yeah. is my story. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, your books, I think, have sort of followed your life in a way. Yeah. And thinking that you, the, the, your first book came out, what, in 1996? Yeah. And so you've kind of grown up with your own books yeah. in a way. Yeah. And, and now, you know, the, the main character in Tempting Fake Abby, she's 43 years old. Yeah. You know, she's, she feels, well, her marriage, she's sort of, she's stuck. Yeah. It, it's sort of in a quagmire of, of just feeling like she's not there, yeah. and, and, and there, it's a lot of other factors. But where did the seed for this story come from? Where did that little, that little seed start to grow? Well, the, the, first, the first thing was noticing how many women around me in their mid-40s were leaving their husbands, and, and it always transpired they were having affairs. So I really started to think, well, mm -hmm. what's going on with women of this age? And, and thinking about women who had spent their 30s devoted to their children mm -hmm. and raising their kids, and suddenly their kids are in high school, and a lot of them haven't worked since they had babies, right. and they, I realized how irrelevant you can feel. And I also um, definitely feel that, that at this age, there's an invisibility factor sure, um, and you just, you know, you go from walking into stores and having the sales assistants jump, you know, um, miss, can I help you to, I'll be with you in a minute, ma'am. Ma'am, yeah. or, yes, right. <laughs> and that's, you love it when they say miss, but when the ma'am comes out. Oh, know, the ma'am is just terrible. Oh, it um, is. <laughs> but I, I think, you know, that, those two things couple together. And then, you know, I, I did... Um, a book, a literary festival with a young author who was a, a young, handsome author who was terribly nice and then did send me a few gently flirtatious emails. And I realized how easily these things can happen, particularly over social media, sure, emails, texts, sure. Facebook, yeah. and how um, so often it has nothing to do with your family. It often has nothing to do even with the person who's paying you attention, it's about feeling noticed at an age and a stage in life where you're really feeling irrelevant right, and invisible. Right. Yeah. And I think I think so many women in their forties, you know, having children, their children are older now. They've spent so much time on everybody else. Yes. And neglected themselves. So yes. so now when, when there's more time and you feel like you, 
I think they feel lost in a way. Yeah, I yeah. think that's very yeah. true. And I yeah. think that there, there is this sort of window of opportunity where a woman is very vulnerable. Yeah. So I want to know, um, I know you do research on, on many of your books, you, and I, from your journalistic background, too. I'm sure you can't help yourself with that sort of thing. Yeah. But what did you do for research for this? Did you talk to a lot of women, even in your own community, or friends, family, that sort of thing? I did. I, I talked to people. That, that's mostly my research is never particularly high tech. But I talked, to, yeah. I, I talked to a lot of women, and interestingly, I also talked to a lot of men. I talked to the husbands. I talked to the husbands about how it felt when their wives suddenly declared sure. this. Right. Um, so I talk a lot, and I watch, yeah. and I listen. Yeah. I think that would be really interesting, just yeah. observing and, yeah. then, and putting it down. So Gabby, you know, 18-year marriage, her husband Elliot, two, two daughters, um, two, two kids. You know, it's suburbia. Mm. It's suburbia, you know, and that's where we are. We're in the suburbs yeah. of Chicago, and I believe you live in suburbia. I do. Too. I live yeah. in Westport, With, Connecticut, which right. is, and I think there's, there's also something yeah. about the suburban marriage, which right. is, right. It, it, you can, however good your marriage is, however exciting it is in the beginning, after 18 years of marriage living right. in the suburbia, it becomes pots and pans. Right. And I think that also, you know, when you when your kids are gone and you're not frantically running around, you suddenly think, well, is, is this all there is? Right. And there's also the excitement that comes from having, right. having someone yeah. pay you attention. You know, observing women and talking to other women, mm. um, did you notice that it happened more with women who had given up their careers yeah. and had sort of devoted or, themselves totally yeah. to their families, but not themselves, yes. and not as much with women who had continued their careers? Yeah. So. Certainly the women that I saw this happen to mm -hmm. had stopped working. And I, I you know, I, I always, whenever I speak to young people and young women, I always say to them, you know, you've got to keep doing something because it gives you choices and also because I think it's so important to be defined by something other than someone's wife and someone's mother. Right. You know, affairs, you know, we've always, so much literature and, and even what we watch in the media on TV and everything, it's, it's men having affairs, you know, but then you think of some of the, two of the greatest characters in, in in classic literature, we yeah. think of Anna Karenina, or we think Madame of Bovary. Hes oh, Madame Bovary. Yeah. We think of Hester Prynne. Yeah. We think of those yeah. types of characters. So it's a little different, you know. There, yeah, sure, there's more contemporary literature, but this is really touching on the subject that I think is happening a lot. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So it's not. Yeah. It's not so much what what we've heard in in more classic literature. Um, in this book, I think you analyze a little bit of you know the choices we make in life is is a big is a character in itself in this book, but it's also you know when women do do things maybe out of bad choices, but also what society how they judge us. Mm. Oh, and, well, yeah, yeah, which I think can be you know you it, but you make you make characters sympathetic, you know, because we're all human and we do make these mistakes. That, and that's yeah. that's exactly what I'm trying to do. Yeah. I'm. What I'm interested in writing about is the human condition, and we're all flawed, and we all make mistakes. Um, I think, unfortunately, we are living in times that are more judgmental than ever before, and it is so easy to look at other people and make these judgments about choices that they make. And yet, I think in family picture, certainly, right. and, and I've had this feedback from women who say, I, I, was, I knew I was going to hate it because I cannot read a book about adultery because I am so anti adult And then they found themselves actually not condoning it, but empathizing, understanding, understanding. it. And I think, right. you know, we all make mistakes. They may not be as big as having affairs, um, yeah. but we do make mistakes. And, and I'm interested in people's flaws. I'm mm -hmm. interested in the mistakes. Yeah. Well, we're all flawed. Mm -hmm. But I think I, what you do so well is that, um, and I think it's harder than you th we think, writing that, because there's that fine line writing about character and that fine line of, of taking it over to the point where you aren't sympathetic, mm -hmm. that they are, but the choices, but you, but you do such a good job of making us really think about ourselves in those situations. Oh, yeah. Thank you, thank yeah. you. It's interesting, thinking about it as you're talking, I almost wonder whether, uh, you know, when something happens with this younger man, as it does, and it's right. only once, right. and it's very quick, and Gabby is instantly filled with remorse and shame and guilt, and I almost wonder, I think perhaps that's why we are able to feel for her. 
I right. think perhaps if she was cavalier about it, right, exactly. um, we might feel very differently. Yeah. But but we you can feel her pain mm. and, and knowing the consequences that she she realizes and mm. that sort of thing. But it's um, that was that was very easy to 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 be in her shoes in that in that Thank situation. You. Um, you know, the emails in this book were interesting. Yeah. And you talked about for yourself having someone email you, yeah. and there is that detachment where it's safe. It's a safe environment to a certain extent, but then how you can be drawn in, how you can flirt and you can do yeah. those type of things over certain types of media that you couldn't do face to face. Well, and all of these situations yeah. are occurring over social media. And I think there are two things here or a couple of things. I think um, one of them is it's very easy to create a false intimacy on social media. The other thing is it isn't real. Now, you know, none of us are, are waking up first thing in the morning and posting a photograph on Facebook of ourselves with bedhead and puffy eyes. We, yeah. are, we are presenting the glossiest and most perfect right. aspects of our lives, of who we want people to think we are. And it's exactly the same with email. We can be pithy and witty and wise in email. Yeah. We can present yeah. a version of ourselves that isn't actually real. Is this, is this very glossy, perfect right. version of ourselves, which is also why I think these relationships aren't lasting. Right. And also, too, I think women who try so hard to look younger and they in, instead of trying just to, to age gracefully let's mm. put it the way and feel like they, they can be comfortable with who they are and how they look and everything and because I think that sense that makes a sort of a, a facade mm. that's not real for so many people yes yeah. I, I think yeah. that's very true there's yeah. I don't know if you've ever read any Brene Brown oh okay but she yeah. talks an awful lot about how the, the purpose in life is is to connect on a human level yeah. and the only way that we can do that is to show our vulnerabilities is to because all of us feel deep down that we're not good enough right. and the only way to actually connect is to drop the armor and and to to really show people yeah. who we are um, Gabby's originally from London yeah. like you in this book um, what other ways did you put yourself into her character uh, besides from where she's from well I, I yeah. I think her homesickness, actually. Okay. I, I I did my first big tour in England last year, and I hadn't done it for, I hadn't really toured in England for 12 years, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, and it made me miss England in a way yeah. I haven't done since I moved here 13 years ago. Uh, and so I think that that really is what I see in Gabby. This, this for me, Gabby is just filled with my own nostalgia. Mm -hmm. For okay. England. Ah, okay. So, so what do you miss about the UK, or even being in, you know, all of Britain, but also what you, the access to Europe and everything? Mm. What are those parts do you miss after oh, being miss, here for thirteen I'm, years? I miss the really silly things. I miss I miss English humour, um, and, and I miss how yeah. no one takes themselves very seriously yeah. in England. People right. take themselves much more seriously here. Yeah. Um, I miss a really decent cup of tea. <laughs> um, I miss Europe. I miss Europe desperately. I miss being able to jump on a plane and hop over to France or Italy for the uh, weekend. Uh, I, I'm, I miss that yeah, an awful lot. Yeah, oh, um, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, in, in the book, what was very interesting, and also too, there were, there were two, two scenes. It's also the, the women's group that she joins mm. and the characters in that, but also too, when she goes out for an evening, and I can't remember the name of the... Um, the place where they go out, where she goes out with moms, the other moms yeah. in a group. Oh, at the, be at the beginning of yes, the book? Yeah. right. And, and just the way you can describe another woman, or, or either in either group, very in just a couple of sentences, and you know what kind of person that is. Mm -hmm. And for me, having living in a similar sort of right. environment, yeah. I could see women that I know yeah. in that. Yeah. And I think a lot of people can relate to that. And the way you can describe someone and get an essence of really who they are in a yeah. very, just a few sentences. I, uh, I've had, this is the first book that I've ever actually set in my town of Westport, Connecticut. For years, yeah. I created the fictitious town of Highfield. And I set it in Westport, and of course, already I'm getting messages from people <laughs> saying, I recognize people and I think you don't because I never base Good. my characters on real people. But what they're, I think there are a couple of things, I think they, they want to recognize people, they're looking for themselves or for their friends and they're, they're a type. 
I, I'm, I'm writing about a type which yeah, I'm sure. quite certain exists here. Oh, yeah. Um, but you do know them. You know exactly who they are. Yeah, many people that we yeah. recognize. It, and yeah. it's, it's very interesting. So I'm sure everyone who reads it knows someone yeah. that, that's very similar, yeah. very similar. You know, the 15th, now this is number 15 mm. that, that's been published. And it's sort of like this arc that you started, starting off with, you know, you're starting maybe young in the 20s, mm -hmm. you know, younger adult, experiencing life, relationships, most of the serious relationship for the first time, but then moving into marriage and children and then midlife and then looking at, you know, all these different things that happen to us over the arc of our lives. Mm. And I know you've gone back a little bit and then gone forward. Do you see this continuing on, moving on as you, you grow as a writer and get older yourself? Yes, I, I think so. My books have always tracked the course of my life. Um, without ever being my story, but I'm feeling, you know, my children are, are about, they're on the precipice of the teenage years, yeah, and right. I know that's going to be fodder for at least three books, <laughs> if not many more. So, yeah, they're yeah. a fodder for a lot of things. Yeah. Aren't they? <laughs> what, what, what would you say is your favorite character in Tempting Fate, or what was your favorite character to write, or even of any of your books, a character that was hard to say goodbye to? Well, you know, the, the characters, that, um, I, the characters in the beach house were very real for me. Nan was very real. All mm -hmm. of them, um, they felt they came to life. I I really love writing those ensemble books, mm -hmm. the beach house sure. and bookends. In both of them, I felt like I created the people that I would want to have in my life, my sort uh, of dream yeah, friends, uh, and I miss them. Oh yeah, um, I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. In this book, really interestingly, my favorite character was one I hadn't planned. Yeah. And I had the book plotted sort of vaguely. Sure. And all of a sudden, um, Gabby went out one night and ended up meeting Julian. Um, and he just strolled onto the page and planted himself there. And I uh. could see him, I could hear him. Um, and I absolutely adored writing him um, and he wasn't planned. Oh wow, yeah. so those are the surprises. Yeah. So I guess my question sort of leads to when, when you sit down to write a new book um, or a novel, do you outline or do you just let the story take you? Mm. Yeah. I used to let the story take me. I always had the theme mm -hmm. and I always had a rough idea of the beginning and the end and the middle was slightly hazy. I sort of let my characters dictate how we got from the beginning to the end. Right. But now that I'm working with my new editor, yeah. um, she won't let me get away with that oh, anymore. She's all about okay. high yeah. concept plots and okay. suspense. And she she really built um, Janet Ivanovich and, and she is the most wonderful editor I've ever worked with. Yeah. She works me harder than I've ever worked in my life. Um, but I think I, I'm creating far b the best books of my career wow. and we plot now. I mean, okay. there's still a huge amount of freedom right. and, and the right. characters oh. can still take the stories off in sure. a different direction. Yeah. But we do, we follow the, the Greek traditional three act okay. structure and I know, you know, what's happening in, in act one, what dramatic point is going to spin us into act right, two. Right. And you feel that that's helped you in, in, in writing, you think, or at least with this book? I think she she's taught me more than I could ever have imagined about the work involved in editing oh, and the honing yeah. and the crafting. Okay, very interesting. Mm. So, so Gabby in the book refinishes furniture, mm. which I thought, it, and, and my mother used to love to do that, yeah. and, and my husband even does that yeah. some. And it, did you put it in there purposefully or was it just something that came to you about her character because it seems kind of symbolic? Oh, you know? no, it's actually yeah. all of my yeah. little hobbies and quirks and passions oh, end up okay. making their way okay. into my book. And actually, although I don't really refinish furniture, uh. I have done, I know how to French polish. Right. And, <laughs> I, and I do actually, my writing desk is this old desk that I found at the consignment store. Yeah that I stripped and painted and mm -hmm. replaced the handles and, and it looks like this wonderful Swedish antique yeah. and oh, it's cool. my consignment store find. <laughs> That's great. So are there, is there a difference when, when, you, when you go over to the UK or when you, you tour there and you know that your books maybe will 
release a little bit earlier there than they here are in the States. Is there a difference, do you see, in your readers in the UK or any other country? Or do we all come to these stories for the same reasons, do you oh. think? I, I think we all, we all come to the stories for the same reasons. And, and actually, because I live here, and because I have so many children and such a busy life, I really don't get back to the UK very often. Um, and I, when I did my tour in the UK, I was nervous because here people are incredibly warm and, and I thought that they might not be quite so receptive in England. And I hadn't been out on the road for years yeah, and years. Right. And I went out last summer and I was just so overwhelmed by the reaction everywhere I went. Yeah crowds of women oh, and women wonderful. my age I mean yeah, not because I, sure. I have a lot of these young girls sure. who love my books and I understand they pick up the early books but they can't really understand what I'm writing now yeah. and when I was in England it was you know all my middle-aged women and they were just they were wonderful well they've kind of grown with you yeah. with their books so that's that's wonderful yeah. so um as being a journalist and I know you were a journalist in your 20s yeah. Having that experience, did, to, did that experience help you in your fiction writing? Oh, unquestionably. Yeah. In what ways? Um, I always say it was the greatest training I ever could have had because I had an editor standing over me. And I worked on a national daily newspaper right, in right. England, the Daily Express. And I had an edit editor standing over me every day saying, Jane, we need... 1,500 words on this in an hour. And I couldn't wow. say, well, I'm sorry, I'm not inspired today. <laughs> right. you know, I had to yeah. produce those 1,500 words, and they had to be good. Um, and whether I felt like it or not, whether I was inspired mm -hmm. or not. And it has been such great training, because that's how I write my books. I set myself a word count. I sit at the computer, and I will not get up until those words are on the page. Yeah. So that, that discipline yeah. it's it's really all about helps. Discipline. Yeah. I think everybody... We like to think that being a novelist is this wonderfully romantic career <laughs> yeah, where we're right. waking up in the yeah. middle of the night and it, it, it's a job like yeah. any other job and yeah. I, I, but it's in, in many ways harder because, because of the creativity required and that creativity is not there every day. Right. Sure. But the only way to unlock it when it dries up is to keep writing right. anyway. Okay. So, so do you feel that you've grown as a writer from you know your first book, Talking Straight, mm. until until Tempting yes. Fate? Yes, I yeah. think I, I've grown tremendously. I actually find it very hard to go back and read those early books. They also weren't really edited. I mean, that's the other thing. What I've learned about editing is, is I now go through at least four edits, um, and and usually one you know, partial, if not entire, rewrite. Right. Um, back then, I did nothing. I, I wrote my books, I handed them in, I might change a few words mm -hmm. here and there, but sure. that was it. And mostly what I think when I go back and read those early books is, they need a bloody good editor. Yeah. <laughs> and I think you have one. Yeah, now, really yes, now, yeah, now right. Do, yeah. You know? Gabby in this one, I know you, you love to cook yourself. Yeah. yeah, and so does Gabby in this yeah. book. So tell, tell us one of your favorite comfort foods that you love to cook for your family. Um, oh, I think probably um, the two things that I cook on a regular basis. Um, this is where I bring, I bring a little bit of, of old England to yeah. new England. Um, are... Um, cottage pie which actually you would call shepherd's pie right. but um but mm -hmm. it the difference is shepherd's pie in england cottage pie is made with beef and shepherd's pie is exactly the same but made with lamb so i make it with beef so okay. um but it's based shepherd's pie yeah. and also a dish called toad in the hole oh yes right yeah so, and that's like and that is um sausages in in basically Yorkshire pudding batter, which is um, like popovers. So yeah. it's there embedded in popovers yeah. with an onion gravy. Yeah. Those are yeah. my, my go-to Everyone, comfort. they love that, I'm yeah. sure, I'm sure. So you, I read that you had done some journalistic coverage for ABC yeah. on the royal family. Yeah. So have you done any of that recently? Or is that, no. that you've done it that for a, a while? It was, it was a long time ago. Did you enjoy that though, doing that I sort of really thing? I really loved it actually. <laughs> I was, I, they asked me, first of all, they, they asked me to write a book for them about the history of royal weddings mm -hmm. leading up to um, Prince William and, and right. 
Kate Middleton's wedding. So, and they gave me a team of researchers and, and I, I found it fascinating, actually. It was completely different, but really fascinating. I learned so much. And then they asked me to join their live news team on the day of the wedding. Oh, wow. On ABC Very cool. News on the radio. So I, okay. I went and we watched the whole, and we were there for hours. And actually what I loved was that I, I recognized everyone coming. I mean, I knew who they all were and the hats and, mm -hmm. oh, it was, it was really fun. I loved, I, I had a radio show for years in, in England. Oh, and, okay. and so it was very familiar to me. I yeah. really enjoyed oh, it. Oh, that's yeah. so, so wonderful. Yeah. You know, I read that Kirkus Reviews, and it's on the front of the book, too. And Kirkus, when you get a good Kirkus Review, that means a lot. I know. I, I mean, know. It, that means a yeah. tremendous amount about a book yeah. and an author. And they gave it a, a scarlet letter for the 21st century. Yeah. And without spoilers, what do you think about that review? Oh, I, I, Kirkus is, is the one review that I'm always yeah. very, very nervous right. about. And Kirkus haven't always been so kind to me. Um, and you know it's coming. You can't avoid the right. Kirkus review. And when I heard that that's what they had written, yeah. I mean, this glowing review ending with the Scarlet Letter. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it just, what a gift. Yeah. What yeah. an extraordinary yeah. gift. And what a great tagline yeah. for the cover. Well, it was, yeah. and it was a fantastic review. Yeah, it was but, a fantastic but, review. But when you get a Kirkus, that's, that's, that's congratulatory yeah. stuff yeah. right there. That's wonderful. So what do, you, what do you hope readers will take away from Tempting Fate? Well, um, I, I think probably a little understanding, um, a, a little less judgment perhaps, mm -hmm. um, which, which is certainly feedback I've been getting. And I think for those women who are finding themselves tempted, hopefully a glimpse into what their future sure. may hold sure. um, were they to carry yeah. on down yeah. that route. Okay. So what are you working on now or planning to work on? Well, I finished the next one Oh already. my gosh, wow. Yeah. Well, I'm contracted now to do two books a year. Okay, so, wow, um, that's a busy schedule. It is a busy yeah. schedule. Yeah. Um, so the next one is called Saving Grace. I think it comes out either December or January. Okay. And I haven't, I haven't quite sort of figured out how to talk about it, okay. but it, it's, it's a couple who take on an assistant, a personal assistant who appears to be completely wonderful, the Mary Poppins of the assistant world, until she starts to systematically destroy their lives. Oh, okay. So um, that one's that's done. That's a major tease. Okay, yeah. that's, that's great. And then I'm, I have started the next, next one, but then I had to stop because I was starting it in the middle of my tour and I was, and I just yeah. thought, Jane, this is actually, you know, if I get days off, I need to crawl into bed and read I think and that's recharge. A, that's a and, very good plan. Yes, and not worry about writing until <laughs> right. the tour is over. Sure. Great conversation with Jane Green. You have to read her new book. It's called Tempting Fate. So thanks for joining me on Authors Revealed. <laughs>